ready to study the book of Colossians. Colossians, uh, it's a New Testament epistle. It's one of the four prison letters of Paul. Uh, actually, where they, where they think he wrote from prison, Paul was in prison many times. So we have trouble. He was imprisoned in Caesarea. He was imprisoned in Jerusalem. He was imprisoned in Philippi. Uh, but most people think it was his Roman imprisonments where he wrote the, the what we would call the prison letters, and this would be one of the one of the prison letters. The, he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon also for, uh, as part of his his prison letters. Uh, so he's kind of an interesting guy. He sent three letters to the churches in Asia uh, Minor. Uh, he linked them with his colleague, Tychius, and they seemed to uh, indicate that he wrote them at the same time. So Tychius was making, making a trip, and he was heading toward that way, so he gave him a letter to all three churches. The three churches are fairly close together. Uh, if you look, uh, Colossae at one time was a major city. It sat right on the major road. Uh, the major road that went through there was called the Appian Way. And it went from Rome all the way to Egypt. Uh, remember, Rome had a system of road building that was one of the finest in the entire world. Uh, the Roman road system is still in existence and common everyday use today. So think about it, 2,000 year old roads that they still use and they're still there, still today. In fact, they're so rutted that uh, when they build cars in that part of the world, they build them the same width as the ruts in the roads <laughs> because you couldn't, even, you couldn't even get around. If you fell into the ruts, you, you can hardly get out. So the Romans did a, an interesting thing when they would, remember Rome, Rome is, we think of it as being known as a great conquering nation. Actually, that was the least of what they did. Rome was, uh, uh, did feats of engineering that are spectacular, that are still uh, really well beyond anything that a lot of things we could do today. The Romans were one who developed the arch. And uh, the arch became vitally important because it allowed them to, to uh, do a system which was called aqueducts. Where they would, I made this a pretty heavy plane, but it, it really isn't. When you get to the aqueduct at Caesarea Marmot time, for, for instance, runs 18 miles long, and it has a drop of only 18 inches. But it's downhill, so water runs downhill, but it doesn't, it, it, what they've done is they've controlled the flow by the amount of water that they do. So when they build roads, one of the things they would do, they would decide where they were gonna build a road. They would dig a pit four feet deep, and in that, they would, that would be the start of their road. Then they would, they would put first, the thing that they would put in here is pebbles. And they would just put pebbles up about 18 inches. And then they would take sand and they would pack sand down. The sand would pack down, oh, probably <laughs> another 18 inches to make it uh, probably higher up here to about three feet. Then they put a base of pebbles again a foot and then they put paving stones right on top. And the paving stones were uh, anywhere from three to four inches thick. And uh, they would take them almost like we would go up and get shale uh, up here and we come down and we make our nice patios. I don't know if you guys ever made a patio in your yard from the, sh the shale up in the, we did. And so that's there. So, these roads were magnificent. They're still in use today. They're in better shape than Highway 41. And they're thousands of years old. Some are, remember 300 BC uh, was the, the start when Rome started to really, really start to, to move. So they came in. So the Romans <laughs> built that road, but due to, uh, because of the Lacasta River, uh, came out of its banks, it, it, it flowed a different way. The Romans moved the road and they moved it away from Colossae and they moved it uh, about 13 miles away, which doesn't sound like much to us, but that would be a major move in those days. So it took Colossae from being a very, very important city to becoming just uh, a city that was important in antiquity. And so it's kind of an interesting thing. 
Uh, the author of the book of Colossians uh, is Paul. There's, uh, and I always like to, to bring this up. Uh, I believe it's Paul. I don't have any problem with it being Paul. But uh, those that say it is not Paul, they have reasons for saying it. One reason that they have is 34 words in the book are found nowhere else in any of Paul's writings. 34 words. That's a significant amount of words. You understand? So he used 34 different words that he never used anyplace else. Uh, Paul, uh, the... The stylistically, uh, the style of writing is a little different than he used otherwise. Paul normally, when he wrote, wrote, uh, <coughs> wrote very Jewish. In other words, it was very rabbinical in its teaching. And the rabbinical means that uh, they would put it in a system of argumentation. Uh, they loved to argue. That was... That was their way of learning. In other words, you would never sit in a class like this under a rabbi. He would make a statement and wait for somebody to say something about the statement. And then that would develop uh, dialogue. And as dialogue further down and, and refined, then you got to the exact meat of the matter. So that's the way that everything was run. This book wasn't written in that particular manner. He simply says things. He doesn't, he doesn't offer wiggle room. So at the, the author of this, uh, their doubts, they fall into two things. So one is the style, the other is theology. Uh, the theology that you find in the book of Colossians differs somewhat in the area of baptism than what Paul writes in Romans. He writes a different thing, but it's in addition to. You understand? So what you, what you look at when you uh, try and figure out uh, if somebody wrote more than one book, you look and see, is there disagreement? Did they make disagreement? Uh, no, they made differences. And there's, there's a whole lot of difference between a different thing than it is an actual disagreement saying what that is wrong and this is right. Get what I'm saying there? Do you catch? The, because that's a fine point, but... But uh, it causes a lot of trouble with this. So first, some scholars question Paul's uh, on theological grounds. Uh, in Colossians, the doctor of Christ is developed in a hymn. The whole, the whole thing, the whole doctrine of Christ is developed in the hymn. And the hymn is found in chapter 1. Uh, on, on its verse 15 to 20. And that's a hymn, and that's a, that's a major hymn in, in the early church. It's found all over in all the secular writings everywhere. And that he develops his whole doctrine of Christ off of this hymn. It's a good thing, good way to do things. Why did they use a hymn so much? Yeah. How many of you, if I asked you what came after K in the alphabet, would say L, or would you go A, B, C, D, E, F, G? <laughs> you know. So this, this uh, it, it becomes a mnemonic, a way, a, a, a process that you can remember things by putting it into hymns. So these, these are, this wonderful hymn in Colossians, this, this first hymn, Paul develops uh, all of his theology on that. Uh, and so there's a, he's seen as, he, he develops a, a tremendously important, he uses a word that causes tremendous problems. <laughs> and did anybody guess what that one is? Firstborn would lead you to think what? Yeah. Well, not only that there were others after him, but there would have to be somebody before him. And so this, this gets to be, this, because of the use of the word firstborn that he uses in Colossians is where you get all the cults will run you very quickly to Colossians. If, if you were to talk to a Jehovah's Witness, this is one of their, their absolute major verses instead of saying that he was the God, that he was a God, because he was simply born. 
And we got to remember that when we're talking, we're talking about the, the area of Asia Minor. And in that area, we had some really, really different things that came about. I, I like the way that, that he would do that, but they had no problem making all kinds of gods. Their gods, the, the, the Greek gods, were a pantheon of gods who lived on Mount Olympus. Remember, we all know the Greek mythology. Every one of you could say, you know, Zeus was the chief god of the Greek mythology. Well, the, their system of gods came. They had God uh, <coughs> slash Zeus. Then all of a sudden we have a pantheon of gods that become lesser gods until some are called, as we come down the scale, we have a god-man. Who is a god-man? Can you think of one? There you go, Herc. Hercules was a, <laughs> C-U-L-E-S, I could say it if I wanted to, but Hercules was a, was a god-man. He was, he was a form. Then they had other guys that they called Aeons, A-E-O-N-S. And Aeons were sometimes God, sometimes man. Sometimes uh, Jason and the Argonauts uh, runs into Aeons and, and those things. And they're part of that myth mythology, that mythological system of gods. So when all of a sudden you had teaching that comes walking in, uh, into Colossae, you had people that walked in there. Who do you think the major source of problems were in, in the theology there? Do you think it was the Greeks? No, it was the Jews. The Jews at this time, the Jews started to, to develop a system called the Kabbalah. K A B B. A-L-A-H, the Kabbalah. The Kabbalists, Kabbalists are around today, very popular today, r extremely popular. Who's one of the Kabbalists that's very famous today? Madonna. Madonna, yeah, just went. And uh, now, uh, to give you an idea how you can find if somebody's a, a, a Kabbalist, you can see the red string. They'll wear a red string around their, around their wrist. And, uh, that's for magical incantation, you know what that's for. That's got a certain amount of knots and those knots are tied to a verse in Deuteronomy and, uh, because of what they do. So Kabbalists do, they're, they're responsible for today in the Christian world, a lot of problems that we're having come from Kabbalism. Kabbalism reached its peak, really came to the forefront in the 14th century. Uh, and there, they, they, the Kabbalists uh, developed a system called Gamma'iya. Gamma, and uh, that might be spelled wrong. Gamma'iya simply means because uh, if, if you were to look at the Hebrew alphabet and the Greek alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, A, B, D, uh, would go along the alpha, beta, delta, uh, and it's the same with Greek. And so they're all, that's the way their numbers go too. So if it was Hebrew, it goes this way. If it was Greek, it reads the other way, and it's alpha, beta, gamma, delta, going the other way. They, that's their, their numbering system too. You understand? So a letter is assigned a number. So... That's how you get secret messages. That's what Gamma'ia is. As you look at the scripture and you see what letter was there and then you develop what was the secret message that was in there. It becomes a real problem because most of Gamma'ia is done in the Old Testament. It's really hard to do in Greek so they don't do it very much. The only one they play it with in Greek is 666. Because we've got to know who the Antichrist is, so we're always figuring out uh, who would be the Antichrist. But in this, and so there's a great freedom. One of the things you have to know in Jewish, ancient Jewish manuscripts, 
one of the problems with ancient Jewish manuscripts was there was no vowels. No vowels. And I'm going to make this even more fun. There was no spacing for words. And I'm going to make it more fun. There's no spacing for sentences. And there's no spacing for paragraphs. So you just get this monstrous list of letters and have fun. <laughs> and so how now does that give you a new idea about scribes, how, how very important they were that they were the ones who, who had, could actually read this at, at a very rapid rate. And you can. It doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, you can. One of the great things about Hebrew language that I love more than anything else, you can't spell anything wrong. If it sounds like it, it's right. It's called a phonetic language. <laughs> so if it sounds like, if you can sound it out, the word that I said by what I put up there, it's correct. So you can put whatever you want. But there comes to be some problems. So we'll take a, a letter like uh, D, G. OK. Now, remember, you're reading right to left because we're Hebrews now, right? OK, so what is that word? Dog? OK, could be. Could it be dig? And uh, could it be uh, Doug, D-O-U-G? Yeah, because that would be, you could put two vowels in. And so eventually what happened is Hebrew began to, to insert vowels. And so it was called vowel pointing. And so we hear a lot about a group that you hear mentioned to you all the time when you talk about the scriptures. How many of you heard of the Masoretes? Masoretic text. The Masoretic text, they were, the Masoretes were the ones who began to supply vowels for the word so that it made it a whole lot easier to read. So through a series of dots and dashes and jots and tittles, the two words that Jesus used, uh, they began to make words more readily readable, easier to read. So one of the things that I like to do, I have a book called, uh, I have the original, I have a copy of the original temple scroll that was in Israel, uh, the, that they, the temple scroll that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I wanted that so bad. The book came out. Because it's a scholarly book, what do you think the price of this puppy was? You could guess. Oh, it's 400, which is 5,000. I wouldn't even, I didn't want it at that price. 400. I went, oh, I want that so bad. And so I can remember, this is a true story. I'm playing golf with a doctor one time, and he says, if you make a par or better on this hole, I'll buy you the book. A little pressure. <laughs> I think I took a 13. <laughs> uh, so. And he didn't buy me the book either. <laughs> that, that was just a, I won't mention his name. But, uh, but anyway, to, make a, to, to finish that story, what makes it really good, I'm sitting at home one time. Maxine used to be on the library board. Did you know that here in Post Falls? Did I ever tell you the story of her on the library board? You know Maxine, my wife the most beautiful, quietest, sweetest lady in the world. She's on the board. She gets, I go in and I get a book in the children's section. And it, this book tells them how to, kids, how to raise demons. Gives them the language. At that time, I was working for the sheriff's department in a capacity as an occult investigator. Uh, it was in the 70s. No, the 80s, and there was a lot of occult crime going on in Spokane. If you remember, they were digging up graves. They were doing, all, and so he needed somebody with a police background and a theological background to become this occult investigator. So there's six in the United States, and we all keep in touch on occult crimes and get called as a witness, as an expert witness a lot of times. So the stuff that's in this book is absolute truth. I mean, it wasn't a children's fantasy book. Somebody was teaching children how to raise demons, <laughs> how the occult. So I said, this is a terrible book. So Maxine asked the library, you got to take this off the shelf. And they say, no, we're a library. We don't. We need freedom of 
expression and all this thing. So she tried two or three times. Finally, she took it off the shelf and burned it. <laughs> and so then they asked her at a board meeting one time, whatever happened to that book? She said, I burned it. So they fired her. But I just love her because she did. She did. She paid for it. She, she gave the money. So it was, it was, I think she did absolutely right. But uh, there's that stuff out there available. I don't know why we got here. What the heck was I talking about to get us into Maxine? Anyway, she's a nice lady. <laughs> Forgive her. But this, uh, this system uh, really becomes abused when people come in and they start doing things. Uh, there's a guy named Dorfman. Now, he is a reporter, a Jewish reporter. He's the guy that re resurrected Gamaliel, and he wrote a book called The Bible Codes. How many of you have heard of The Bible Codes? Yeah. All garbage, pure, let me use the correct word, crap. Jim did it in the sermon, so I can say it here. But absolutely, I mean, that's, that's unbelievable garbage. If you, if you buy any of that, it's just stupidity. Because if God is going to write in secret that we wouldn't know the answer until the advent of the computer, what kind of God is that? Do you understand what he's saying? So you really have to watch because that's a bad teaching. That's an ugly, 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 bad teaching. But that's what was going on in Colossae. Colossae was saying, we have a, a system, it began to be the system of, of Kabbalism and it was mixed with Gnosticism. Now Gnosis, the word Gnosis in Greek means knowledge. So Gnostics were those that had secret knowledge. I got a secret that God gave me. That's very interesting. Do we have Gnostics today? Oh, yeah. uh, go, to the, go to the Christian bookstore. Over half the books are Gnostic. Uh, I got a secret message. That would scare me to death. If God gave me a secret message for you and I charged you, <laughs> wouldn't that be scary? <laughs> I want you to tell people this. And okay, for. Four ninety-five. I'll tell them. <laughs> That's scary. So, this was happening there. So, we have all of this going on in Colossae. You understand? We have the meetings of. We have the Jewish Kabbalists that are the forerunner, actually, of the Kabbalists, and the forerunner of the Gnostics, and they were coming together. Colossae had a tremendous. Worship of angels. They worship the angel Michael. There's a legend that said that Michael came one time and saved them all from a flood. What happened? The Castor River flows into Colossae, flows into town, and then goes down underground, and then comes up again about four miles away and meets the, the Castor, meets the Lystra liver, uh, liver, River over here, where it gets swallowed up. Was, one time it was supposed to be a flood. There was uh, the, the uh, Michael, the great archangel, appears, commands the water to go underground, saves the city. So they literally had the worship of Michael, the archangel. So Michael is an important personage of God. I don't want to take that away. But Michael has a specific task. What is it? Who can tell me what Michael's task, uh, according to the Bible? In fact, he's the patron saint of policeman. Do you know that, Michael? Hardest thing I had to get rid of when I became a Christian. Hardest thing, my St. Michael's medal that I wore through lots and lots of shootouts and riots and fights with people and with knives. and This was a big thing to me. And I can remember the taking off of the St. Michael medal was, uh, it was flat scary. You know, but he was the policeman. He's the one who threw uh, Satan out of heaven. Michael was the one who led the forces that said Michael out of heaven. And then it says in Daniel chapter 10, uh, it mentions Michael. It says the prince of your country. Uh, he was waiting by the uh, he was waiting by the Ulai Canal, and while he was there, remember an angel came and said. I tried to get through to you. Gabriel came. I tried to get through to you, but I was opposed by the prince of Persia for 21 days until Michael, the prince of your people, came 
and assisted me, and now I was able to get through with the message. So the prince, that word is sar, and sar means God's representative, or the head uh, 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 of your people in the angelic sense. So he is the, the patron angel of the land of Israel. Very important, very mighty, mighty, mighty warrior. He is the mightiest of, of the warriors, and the mightiest of the, of the warrior clans were called what? The cherub. The cherub were the warrior ones. We see the little fat guy with the bow and arrow and valentine shooting people in the butt, making them love. And we say, that's it, no. A cherub is the kind of guy. We have another cherub that's mentioned in the Bible. His name is Abaddon. And Abaddon has also got the name the destroying angel. He's the one that killed 185,000 Assyrians at one whack. He went through Egypt and killed the firstborn of everything in Egypt. He's a very scary character. <laughs> so we have him, we have, we have Michael, we have Abaddon, right? We have Gabriel, who is the messenger of God. That that's, seems to be his major thing. Who is the fourth archangel? Satan, Lucifer, yeah, light bearer. He was the guardian of the throne. Very important position that, that he held. He was also uh, in charge of music. Uh, Satan is great. If you want to read about Satan, read Ezekiel. Twenty-eight and Isaiah fourteen, uh, both will, will tell you about, uh, our, and that might be reversed as I get old. Uh, so Christology. So when we when we had this firstborn, they're walking in and they're saying, "Well, if he was born, then he absolutely couldn't be God. How could he be part of the triune Godhead if he was born?" Right, so the firstborn uh, is used in in to make a statement, and that statement was preeminent. Preeminent means that he was before everything, and uh, uh, but it's very scary. In the English, it comes out firstborn. It shouldn't be. That's not really even a good term. A good term is preeminent. Was there before anything was born. So. This, can you understand how this term, all of a sudden, would you use that if you were a cult and you didn't want to make Jesus? See, the thing with all the cults is you can't leave Jesus in his place, can you? Because he won't accept nothing else. It's Jesus and nothing. And it can't be Jesus and. And so if you want to make a Jesus and, then you would use it. You would go to this Colossians. So Colossians, speak, are you seeing now that this book has a lot of vital importance as we come through? And we haven't even started to study. This is all background. Okay. Uh, the Judaism, you know, he, he talks doctrines about last things and, and baptism, and they're somewhat different than his undisputed letters. In his undisputed letters, when he talks about baptism, he talks about, read what baptism is, what Paul writes about in Romans, and what he writes about Colossians, two different things. So is he saying baptism is different, or is he saying it's both? So, you know, you have to, you have to look. And if you were a critic, you would say he changed his mind, which he didn't. He's simply adding to. Uh, Judaism taught about two ages. This age is under the power of, of evil forces. That's what they thought. And the, come, the age to come. Remember, they keep asking Jesus, is the kingdom coming? Is the new? Because their new age is a, was a very special thing. Their new age, they really wanted it to be an age where they could walk in and, and everything's going to be fine. And everything's going to be, the, all the Romans would be driven off. Jews would be the most important people in the world and all of that. So this sense of, of the two ages came in. And when Paul said that the age had already come with the advent of Christ, they said no, because of the Messiah problem. Remember, there's a Messiah problem with the, with the Jews. I asked a rabbi in Israel, I just 